So, Paul, this is all vaguely reminiscent of a TV show I remember watching when I was a kid, Space 1999. It's sort of been uh, relegated to the dustbin of TV sci-fi. But the idea was that there was the moon, for complicated reasons, got knocked out of the orbit of Earth and the solar system and traversed the galaxy with Martin Landau and Barbara Bain on it, uh, trying to deal with the trials and tribulations of going across the galaxy. I always was struggling with this because it seemed to me that the moon would be pretty cold and a lonely place, a hard place to live if it were traversing uh, the galaxy without a star. Yes, you might think that these planets that they got knocked out would become very cold and unpleasant places, and that, in fact, that's probably true. But some people have speculated that in fact these planets might be a good place for life. And given how many of them there are out there, um, they could actually be the dominant place where you find life in our own Milky Way galaxy. So you're telling me that these crazy stars that are free-floating might potentially be habitable places? These planets that are flung out? Well, um, let's look at the energy budget. Um, so here's where the Earth's surface gets its energy from. And on average, over day and night in the poles and the equator, and after allowing for things scattering off, you get about 200 watts per square meter from the sun on the okay. Earth. So that's because, although we get 1300 watts per square meter, that's at noon on the equator when the sun's Above the atmosphere with yeah. no clouds and so on. Yeah. So if you average over all Earth, it's about that. What else? I mean, that's going to go away if you're flung out into deep space. You're going to get almost yep. nothing from that. So where else? You get some geothermal energy. The middle of the Earth is hot, all that lava, and it actually stays hot. It would have cooled down long since if it hadn't been for all the radioactive elements in the middle of the Earth that actually keep it warm, even now, 4.6 billion years after it formed. So it's not a lot of energy, but it's some. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty pathetic. It's, um, people are using it for energy sources, but it's not very much. You also get some energy from meteorites falling on the surface. I mean, it's quite big when one, one bang, but that's a rare yeah, event. When Tangusa happens, we got a lot in a very short period of time. Yeah, but most of the time, it's just a sort of gentle drift of dust come down from space, makes almost nothing. The solar wind would also go away if you were out, but there's a little bit of energy being dumped from solar in particle sitting. But again, that's pretty small. On Earth, humans actually generate about the same amount of energy as geothermal heat, just with all our burning fossil fuels and nuclear reactors and so on and so forth. Um, but so for an alien, this is about all you're going to get. So at first glance, it looks impossible. You've gone from 200 watts per square meter to 0.03 watts per square meter. Surely that means you're going to absolutely freeze. It does seem that way to me. But I suppose in principle, you could have really thick blanket. So maybe you have an atmosphere that's so thick that the heat can't get out. And then certainly the top of the atmosphere is going to be very cool. But if it's a really, really good blanket, um, maybe it could be warm at the bottom very dark, you'd be living in perpetual blackness under a thick, thick atmosphere. Um, or it could be that there's a really thick sheet of ice, and so at the bottom the geothermal heat's enough to warm it up. And we actually see that in Antarctica, there are things like Lake Vostok underneath four kilometres of ice, which are liquid. Um, so maybe this could happen in space. Let's actually calculate how thick the ice would need to be to get something like this. Okay, so let's imagine we have, and here's the rocky part of some planet and you've got geothermal heat of about 0 0.03 watts per meter squared leaking through there and then we want a layer of water and then we have a very thick layer of ice And assume this is spherically symmetric all the way around the planet. Now, law of conservation of energy tells us that the heat coming through here must also be the heat conducting through here and must also be the heat radiating out into space. So that's also 0 0.03 watts. We want this to be at a temperature above zero. This presumably is going to be very cold out here. So, what physics do we need? There's going to be the radiation here. We've used that many times. So we know that the amount of heat radiated, the power, is given by the Stefan Boltzmann equation, which is the area. Let's assume we're dealing with one square meter here. So A is just one, which is just sigma t to the fourth. And that's got to be equal to 0 0.03 watts. So that means t of the surface is going to be the fourth root or 0 0.03 over sigma, the Stefan Boltzmann constant, 
which comes out as about 27 Kelvin. So, yep, that's pretty cold. How are we going to maintain a difference between 27 Kelvin here? We need this to be 273 Kelvin here. So. Well, for conduction, we need Fourier's equation, which tells us that the heat flow is equal to thermal conductivity times the surface area times the difference in temperature across whatever it is all over the thickness. This is actually the definition of thermal conductivity, so it's telling you that the thicker something is, the less heat gets through it, the more conductive the more heat goes through, more area means more heat, and the bigger temperature gap. Now we know Q, 0.03. We want to find how thick it has to be. We know the temperature difference we want, so we know delta T equals 273 minus 27, which is 246 Kelvin. Area is 1. Now, the thermal conductivity for ice you can look up. It varies with temperature, um, but it's roughly about 3 watts per metre per Kelvin. So we get S equals K A delta T over Q, which comes out as about 25,000 metres of ice, so about 25 kilometres which is a lot, but actually not that unreasonable. Um, in the Earth the deepest points would have uh, deepest parts of the trench would have nearly 20 kilometres of water which could freeze um, and it, it's easy to imagine planets with more water than the Earth. Also this conductivity here is assuming pure ice, whereas realistic ice is going to have cracks and impurities, which is going to make it um, have less conductivity. Also, if the water is very salty, which it may well be, then the, the point at which it freezes is significantly depressed. So, we need about 25 kilometres of ice, maybe less, if you allow for salt and uh, impurities in the ice which is a bit more than the Earth manager, but not a lot, so it's not totally unfeasible.